It is my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest speaker to impart some of his insight on our graduating class. My admiration of Jerry Saltz has grown since his participation in the Hamill Lecture Series here at Boston University in 2007. He has been one of the opinion leaders in the New York art world for more than two decades, known for his, quote, passionate opinions, lively and no-nonsense writing, and insights into contemporary arts and the arts scene in general, unquote. Since 2006, he has been the columnist uh, a columnist for, the, uh, for New York Magazine, and before that he was the senior art critic for The Village Voice. He has been nominated for Pulitzer Prizes in criticism three times, and he was the recipient of the 2007 Frank Jewlett Ma Mather Award in Art Criticism. Mr. Salt has served as visiting critic at Columbia, Yale, and the Art Institute of Chicago, to name only a few, having lectured and been a guest artist at many institutions, including BU, Harvard, MoMA, the Guggenheim, and many others. He has been a contributing editor in Art in America and was the sole advisor on the 1995 Whitney Biennial, and has written for Modern Painters, Parkett, Art in America, Time Out New York, Flash Art, Arts Magazine, and many, many others. In 2003, his book, Seeing Out Loud, the Village Voice Art Columns, 1998 through 1993, a collection of Saltz's Village Voice um, columns, was published by the Figures Pressed, and the volume was reprinted in 2007. It is with pleasure I welcome Jerry Saltz to address the graduating class of 2010. Thank you. Welcome all of you here. I want to address the people seated, clo seated closest to the stage, to you. When I use the word artists in this talk, because I'm from the art world, it means you, okay? So I'm not going to say musicians or actors or actresses. I'll just say art or artists, arts. And what I want to just say to you, first of all, is greetings, prophets. <laughs> greetings, prophets. We come here to bear witness to your passage today. This is the ritual that marks the end of one period of your life and the beginning of another period. This is your day. You are the subject. We are all splendid but dark in this cave in this tribe, our auras change all the time. Yours is changing right now. You have no idea, but there's this fantastic alchemical transaction taking place. And it's going to be a nightmare in about an hour. But <laughs> right now, something amazing is happening. Self-acceptance will be your credo. And we are, as Emerson said, and you are, endless multitudes. The only thing as complex as the entire universe is in your skull, which is nightmarish also, if you think about it. Um, we also know at this point that, in a way, art, that you, we don't teach ourselves art. Do you understand what I mean? You can't teach you, but you can. The weird thing, and parents, I'm going to get a little strange and squirrely right now, but I think your kids are going to understand. Art teaches us. We don't teach it. It is a weird thing. Jasper Johns, the painter, said, you avoid everything you can avoid, then you do what you can't avoid doing, and you do what is helpless and unavoidable. You get out of your own way. The demons you will meet at 3.15 a.m. this morning, give me a call. I'm up with them, too. At 3.17, I've decided with you that my work is no good, that it has to be completely started over. By 3.20, I think I've understood exactly how to fix it. I'm sitting up in bed at this point. My wife is asleep. 
my shoes are almost on because I'm ready to go right to my computer, my studio, wherever. By 324, the demons have repossessed me and you and told you that the solution will not work. <laughs> Parents, you can call your kids anytime you want at 315. And um, it'll be good. In some ways, this transaction is so bizarre, which you will understand because you're living it, that yes, you've decided the styles you work in, okay? Yes, you've decided maybe your subject matter or the color or this or that. But in some ways, I think you'll know what I mean when I say that you don't make art. You don't make music, that the art is using you to make it. Now, this is where it gets a little hippy-dippy. So let me try to give a little bit of a concrete example. Anybody in this side of the room own a dog? Who are the dog owners? What's your dog's name? Bailey. That's a good dog name. Any other name here? There? Lila. Now, here's what happens when you call your dog Bailey, okay? You go, come here, Bailey. And Bailey is, what, is Bailey a retriever or something? Yeah, I got it wrong, it's a chihuahua. Uh, <laughs> how could Bailey be a chihuahua, for God's sake? <laughs> what department are you in? <laughs> Music, they're so abstract. You call Bailey, you go, come here, Bailey. Or, come here, Bailey. And Bailey goes, and runs up, puts his head in your lap, <laughs> slobbers on your, you've had, <laughs> the cat people are laughing over there? No. You've had a direct communication with another species. Now, and that's remarkable and fantastic. And it's more or less how I'm speaking to you in a direct way, and your parents are hearing me. But now let me give you another illustration. Anybody on that side of the room own cats? Okay, there. Say a cat name. What? Sunshine. Is that a cat name? More? Cosmo. The cat people are funny because they have to tell you the name. There'll be a hundred of them. Uh, one more. Sasha. What? Sasha. Sasha. <laughs> it was it Sasha or Dasha? Da oh, sorry. <laughs> Here's what happens when you call Dasha. You go. Come here, Dasha. Now, this is what Dasha will probably do. So I'm going to walk away from the microphone and imitate Dasha. So watch this. Dasha will maybe look at you, just kind of walk around, and then maybe go over to the couch and do this. You see what's happened, don't you? Something extraordinary and sick. You are cats. You are a cat. You communicated by putting a third thing between you and the world. I'm communicating directly. Your parents communicate fairly directly back there. You, not so direct. You want to be loved by everybody everywhere for the rest of time <laughs> for doing this. Let's say you're a, an artist and you go, that's my sculpture. Love me. <laughs> it's pretty strange out there to do such a thing. And it's hard to, un in other words, the cat's communication, which they are cats, is not logical, direct, linear. It is not about understanding. Art is not about understanding. It is not, I think, therefore I am. You all know that. It's I experience, therefore I am. 
No mind-body separation in art. We, in our world, grant what is, not den what is not granted that much, which is that pleasure is an extraordinarily important form of knowledge, of knowing that's what you're making, you big babies. <laughs> art. Oscar Wilde said about understanding, the minute you think you understand a work of art, it is dead to you. You see what I mean about understanding? The minute you think you get something, you get it. It's done. It's over. What I want you to do, I want you to understand that art is the ability to embed thought in material, or in your acting, or in your music. That's your medium. That's your material. I don't care if it's part of the dark matter of the universe, visible or invisible. Art is not optional, my prophets, my loves, my dark but splendids. <laughs> it's part of a cosmic force. It's been here since the beginning. It's never not been here. There's a bunch of coroners that walk around, we call them theoreticians in the art world. I don't know what you call them. And they pronounce things, de oh, don't get upset. Uh, not these people, not your faculty. <laughs> they pronounce things dead. The author's dead, the novel's dead, painting's dead. Is music dead? I don't know yet. Is it? Is, is theater dead? Y y you just don't know. The truth is, mediums do not die, my prophets, until the things they were invented to solve have been solved. It's that simple. If you can tell me an art that's disappeared, that means the problem that it was invented to solve has been solved. Art is no more or less important, in other words, than philosophy, economics, psychology, politics. It's part of a cosmic force. It's part of the whole ball of wax. It is not just a decorative hedge in front of the important stuff. So never think that. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, it's as important as the knowledge you gain from a first kiss or a last goodbye. You are, art tells you things you didn't know you needed to know until you know them, and then you can't imagine not knowing them ever again. And that's pretty weird. That's pretty weird. That's what I mean by you don't teach art. It's teaching you. You're just a stupid acorn that the tree is using. <laughs> My advice, if I have to give you some advice, other than take care of your teeth, for God's sake. <laughs> Mine are fine. I'm just saying. Work. Work. Do you know the only cure for work block? <laughs> work. Work. Use it or lose it. And I'm not kidding you. I have to say one downer thing. If you don't make art, if you don't make your work, Charlie Parker said if you don't play the saxophone for one year, you get one year better. Thank you, Charlie. I would also say if you don't play the saxophone for two years, you may not be a saxophonist. So really, Work, work, work. Work is a vacation from the self and a journey to the self. You understand it's both things at the same time. Bruce Nauman, a famous sculptor, said, work comes out of work. Anybody that's ever made art knows this. Um, now is the perfect time to take chances in your work, to take risks. Beckett said, Samuel Beckett said, fail. Fail more, fail again, fail better. Now, I really want you to make some really bad work this year. Do you, can you just do that for me? Is it that hard? You're so horrible already. <laughs> I can't imagine you not following Beckett's advice. In other way, the, 
in other words, the only way to succeed is by working, by failing, failing again, failing better, fail more. For me, I'm asking you to fail flamboyantly. Not in a mediocre way. It doesn't mean you have to be a zillionaire to, to make a big you know, opera to fail. You could just do a little thing like this, and I promise you it could be true crapola. And when I don't like your work as an art critic, it, just, it doesn't mean your work is no good. It means I don't like it. I ask you, please, prophets, you must live without regret. You must live without regret. Make what you make and make some more. Mat you know, Matisse and Picasso, here's what Matisse did. Matisse would make a painting and then make a painting of the painting and then make a painting of that painting and a painting of that painting. Picasso had a really a better idea. He went to Matisse's studio and made paintings of Matisse's paintings. <laughs> and you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. You're allowed to do that. I don't care where you take from. I care where you take to. I never accept when people say to a student, well, you know, it's been done before. I always tell my students, do it again. Do it again. We'll all know in about five seconds if it's worth doing. You follow me? Just do it, for God's sake. Um, beyond that, I would like you to be able to live on as little money as possible <laughs> with as much style as you can have as much style as you can have, as much joy and as less regret as you can possibly have. My advice to you vampires, I'm sorry teachers, they're paying me to say this. <laughs> My advice is vampires must live with other vampires. If you live alone, <laughs> funny things happen to vampires who live alone. So if you leave our great cities, where we come to be loved by strangers and to share our ideas and to try out our ideas. You must form small gangs. The runt in your gang must be protected above all. And by the way, everybody else in the gang thinks you're the runt. So it doesn't matter. You stay together. In this way, you can take over the world. Old vampires like me, when you come into my vicinity, <laughs> We can smell new blood, we'll know what to do. If you build it, they will come. Just make your bad work. That's all I'm really asking you to do. A couple of other things before I finish. You guys, maybe like no other class that I've ever talked to, entered school one way under certain economic conditions, <laughs> and it's changed a lot. You do not know how lucky you are that that happened. I'm sorry if you owe a lot of money, <laughs> uh, but hierarchies have been broken. A herniations are taking place in the system. Cracks, fissures are appearing in the hierarchy. You understand what I'm saying? That frankly, as one of the gatekeepers two, three, four years ago, you want in, I don't have to let you in. Now, I owe it to myself to pay very careful attention to what you're doing because the language is in motion again. All you have to do, my prophets, is embrace the uncertainty. Don't be afraid of the chaos. It is a creative force and it's yours. You don't have to illustrate the damn thing. Don't think you know it. In our world's parents, there are gods. In the art world, I can tell you there is a god, and his name is Velazquez. <laughs> I don't know who the gods are in these respective worlds. And when other worlds are discovered, they will see the work of Velazquez, and they will still not understand it. They will still find its bottomlessness in this work of art. I want you guys to focus in on your obsession 
Obsession is key, no matter how weird. If you get stuck having to play one note over and over again, just do that. It's pretty weird. Other, your friends will talk you down in the middle of the night if it's getting boring, but you must follow your own obsession. That's the inner shaman in you that lives on the edge of the village of the cathedral of your mind, which is pretty messed up because you're looking for love in all the wrong places for the rest of time instead of just going home. Don't hate me for this. In other words, give yourselves total permission to follow anything. You have to let your talent take you to where it's going to take you, okay? This is, I'm going to just finish in a minute and say that while I want you to have a 30-month career, those are exciting and sexy where everybody's talking about you, what we're really here for is a 30-year career. You want to live a life in art. That's what you are about to do. Many wanted to. Very few can do this. Finally, all I will say to you is, what do you do when you meet at 3.15 in the morning? You could call me, but my phone's always busy at 3.15 because everybody's calling me. And I'm up there trying to work just like you at my computer. What I would say is when you're hearing voices in your head that are saying things like, I didn't go to the right school after all. <laughs> or, I don't really have enough money. And your sort of self-destruction demonic meter is starting to climb my profits. When you go, oh, I don't really know my art history. I don't really know my craft. Right here, what I need you to do when the meter hits this point is just go, but I'm bleeding genius. <laughs> I need you to be delusional. <laughs> you have to believe in yourself. <laughs> I'm not kidding. In the end, if you have all of that, which isn't much. Be like cats, believe in yourself, don't live with regret, brush your teeth, you know, never count anyone out. Define success not as money, not as fame. Define success as time. Define success as credibility. You can get love from your work. I'm going to tell you, it's really easy. And if you need it, that's good for the 30-month career. But credibility is yours. And you go to sleep with it, and it's there at 3.15 in the morning to keep you delusional. All right, bless you, prophets. Make bad art.